Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where I cover nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content. <sighs> Every day I get closer to having a mental breakdown. We're doing another viewer request today. A few of you guys recommended this, and I'm... Oh boy. <laughs> today we're looking at Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny from 1972. This movie is a trip, man. I... I can't make up... Oh my god. I can't make up this stuff, and I can't unsee what I've seen. So we're gonna dive into this so that we can all be traumatized together. It starts out with these elves who are working in a tiny workshop and singing, because uh, as we've established many times on this channel, the elves don't have, but desperately need, an elf union. <laughs> and then one of the elves looks outside and is like, huh, the reindeer are here. But Santa's ass is gone. And my question is, how often does Santa just up and leave the elves? Because they immediately go into a whole rehearsed song about it. So you might be wondering, where is Santa? Well, he's in Miami. No, really, he is crash landed in Dade County amongst the palm trees and is just stuck in a ditch on the beach. Stuck in the sand, thousands of miles from the North Pole, way down in Florida. Yeah, so Santa, it's not even Christmas Eve. It's several days before and Santa was, I don't know, joyriding? And he, he crash landed in Florida and his reindeer were like, we're out, bye, and just left him. They were so hot, they took off to the North Pole. What a predicament. And the narrator tells us in every way possible that Santa is just so uncomfortably warm. That's a lot of heavy clothing to be worn on a beach in Florida. And Santa was mighty uncomfortable. And so to combat the heat, you know, instead of taking off his jacket or getting a drink, or just taking shelter in the shade somewhere, he starts singing. Oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me, who will set old Santa free? Who will give me a helping hand and get my sleigh out of the sand? From a technical standpoint, there's a lot of B-roll choices that I don't understand in this movie. It's like, oh, it's Santa's big musical number. Let's get a close-up of his hand. And now the sleigh, the bottom of the sleigh, and now a palm tree. So now we get all of these shots of all these kids, like so many children, um, like doing various activities and it keeps freeze framing for some reason. This particularly terrifying incident where this kid is jumping off of a roof and it just freezes. <laughs> is that kid okay? Scotty! Hey. And then using the Santa Force, I guess, he just calls all these kids by name and they all go running. And then they have a song accompanied by a kazoo, it sounds like. Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn show up. Hey, Huck, where are all those kids going? I don't know, Tom. Let's go find out. Yeah, I don't know why either. I couldn't tell you why. They don't really do anything. They just kind of show up and are like, huh? That's Santa right there. Hey, Huck, could that be Santa Claus? Hey, it is Santa Claus, Tom. Weird. Hey, Santa, what are you doing here? This is the first time in hundreds of years that I got stuck my sleigh came right down here in the sand. So Santa's like, please kids, I need your help to get my sleigh s unstuck from the sand. Which is kind of diminishing the whole brand of Santa to me, because isn't Santa magic? <laughs> Why does he need all these children's help? What are they gonna do? Hey, do you think if we stick around a while we'll find out what happens? Yeah! <laughs> You think we'll find out what happened? Yeah! <laughs> it's as if the cameraman just kind of forgot that he was still rolling. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's very strange. There's a lot of dead space. 
the kids spend a good amount of time, one by one, just bringing different animals to Santa and being like, could this pull your sleigh? This one girl brings a gorilla. Where did she find a gorilla? And Santa, you know damn well gorillas can't fly. Why are you wasting this kid's time? You just take him around, take him around the front, and then back him in. Back him in, and we'll see what happens. Take him around the front. That's it. Just around the front of the sleigh. Santa keeps saying it. Take him around the front. Take him around. It's almost like, it's almost like the, the donkey wouldn't actually move or... The kids were having trouble, like, in real life as they were filming, and they were just trying to salvage the shot, because he says it, like, a lot of times. Did these kids just go commit armed robbery at a zoo? Not only does Santa not take care of his workers, but I think he's, like, encouraging petty theft amongst children. Well, son, what do you think? Oh my god, there's another one? How many times are we gonna do this, guys? Let's do something else. No, the cow's not gonna pull the sleigh, Mr. Kringle. So by the time the kid with the horse came out, I was genuinely like, is this the entire hour and 10 minutes of this movie? This movie's an hour and 10 minutes, by the way. It doesn't need to be that long. It feels like two years go by in between the start and end of the movie. I've got to try to get out. All those little boys and girls all over the world waiting for their presents. So Santa leans down and starts digging the sleigh out. One, why didn't you do that before? Two, that's not really the issue, I thought, Santa. I thought the issue was you need to fly back to the North Pole. And so Santa, being at a loss for ideas now that apparently every animal on the planet has tried and failed to pull his sleigh, he's like, all right, kids, gather around. I'm going to tell you a story in this 102-degree Florida weather. Because if I'm going to get sunburned, you're all going to get sunburned. And he tells them the story of... You remember about Jack and the Beanstalk. Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh, oh. So here's a weird thing about this movie, and I'm not exactly sure why they did this. I'm sure there's like a distribution reason or something. There's two versions of this movie. In one version, he tells them the story of Thumbelina. That's the version of the movie that I previewed. And what I was ready to give commentary on. This version apparently is not the same version because he's telling them the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Hang on, let me go back and see if I can find the original version, and then if I have time, I'll come back and just review this one off the cuff, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if I have battery for that. I don't know if I have mental fortitude for that, but one problem at a time. Okay, here we go. I found the Thumbelina version. If I were Thumbelina and just to And it's so funny because... Santa starts telling them the story of Thumbelina, and then it cuts to footage of a girl that's not Thumbelina running around in Pirate's Cove, the amusement park, and there's a song. This world would be so different, but I wouldn't find, I wouldn't find at all. And then she, like, goes into, like, um... I don't know, a museum or some kind of attraction, and she's listening to the story of Thumbelina. Welcome to the fairyland of Hans Christian Andersen. I am going to tell you the story of Thumbelina. And I think I read somewhere that, like, the filmmaker um, was just trying to really recycle a bunch of other projects that he had kind of done on the side into a feature length, and that's why Tom Sawyer shows up, and that's why... There's, like, these whole stories within a story. I get that, but it's also funny because it's just like, do you think Santa sat there and told the kids that introduction part of the story? You think he was just like, yep, I'm gonna tell you the story of Thumbelina, kids. It starts with a girl named Janie at an amusement park. She had a good time. You guys probably won't. She wanted ever so badly to have someone to love and to care for. Are you confused as to what this has to do with Christmas? Me too. The answer is... It has nothing to do with Christmas. You're gonna have to learn to accept that. And just when you thought, um, the whole Santa in Miami thing was weird, strap in, kids, because the stories within the story are so much weirder. Oh my god. Story of Thumbelina starts out with, um, this, this woman who, who wants to have a kid. Day after day, I put the kettle on, and no one comes to call. I'm getting so tired of being lonesome. She wants it so bad she's 
talking to herself in her kitchen. I know. This afternoon I'll go see the witch. And maybe she will bring me a little girl. Um, I've got a couple questions about the logistics and overall details of that plan before I'm anywhere near comfortable with it, because it sounds super shady to me. But anyway, she goes to this witch, and if you thought the witch didn't have her own song, you'd be very wrong. Sow a little seed, grow a little princess, twelve new pennies make your wish come true. From a little seed comes a little princess, that's what magic can do. Yeah, that's gonna be in your head forever now. You're welcome. Sow a little seed, grow a little princess. Twelve new pennies make your wish come true. Twelve new pennies make your wish come true. And all the songs, they repeat the chorus, like, a couple times too many times. You're too old to have a child. Ouch, you're not supposed to say that to somebody. Jesus, how are you still in business, ma'am? Do you know what this will cost you? Twelve new pennies. You said it fifteen times. Oh no. Somebody wasn't paying attention. So this lady goes home, immediately plants the seed, and boom, she grew a kid. Then the flower opened, and there was a tiny little girl. Hi. Stay right there, dear. I'll be right back. I never thought I would have a little girl as small as you. Yeah, I have this idea for the next shot. Let's make her walk as far away from the camera and apparently the microphone as humanly possible and then shout her line back to us. I never thought I'd have a kid as small as you. Oh, I'm so glad. I've been a lonesome woman all my life. Oh, what happened here? It's all discolored and oh no. I would love to have been on the set of this movie. I just, I'm so interested, you know? So anyway, Thumbelina's happy. She's living her best life on the table, sleeping in a walnut shell. <laughs> it's funny because Thumbelina is like my grandmother's, one of her favorite fairy tales. And this is just a very slow, very strange rendition. It gets, it gets weirder, you'll see. Oh, and it, the girl is played by the same girl who's listening to the story because she's imagining as herself as Thumbelina, you know? Oh, I love my little dancer on the it's strange, because I feel like they could have done a good job. Like, in a weird way, underneath all the weirdness, there's, like, a genuine sweet storytelling perspective that's just lost in all these, like, weird choices. Thumbelina's new life was to be threatened by a frog whose mother was searching Boy. for a wife Boy. for her son. Oh, dear. Yeah, so Thumbelina, um almost gets married off to a frog. If you don't like, I probably should have said this before, if you're not a fan of like people in costumes, if that like creeps you out, you might just want to look away because it's, it's, it's a lot. My mother's getting me a wife. All this time I've been doing nothing but sitting by the pad going ribbit, ribbit. What I need is a little girl. <sighs> There's a lot to unpack there. No, you know, we're just gonna keep moving. We're just gonna keep pushing through in true Christmas spirit. I've brought you a wife, my son. Isn't she beautiful? While I am fixing up your house where you will live together, I put her on that lily pad so she can't escape. So his mom comes back and is like, hey, I kidnapped a girl for you to marry. She's up on that lily pad. Ba boing ba boing <laughs> bad for her mom because at least in this version she never sees Thumbelina again like Thumbelina never goes back home she's just like oh no my kid is gone and then she doesn't know what happened to her that's sad till a fish felt sorry for her and chewed the roots of the lily pad loose so that it would float downstream oh and then she runs into some bugs <laughs> there are a whole lot this is the clip that I showed my dad when I was previewing this movie. I was, I was watching it last night, and he was just like, Oh, dear God. I'm hungry. Let's get some nice bugs to eat. All right. I'm going over this way. And then I told him it was made in Florida, and as a Florida native himself, he was like, Oh, okay, that makes sense. Sorry, Florida. You get enough shit from everybody else. I'll go that way. I'll stay around here. Okay, the computer doesn't want to work. I'm going to use my phone to start watching now. 
I'm gonna put it over here and we're just gonna pretend that I'm still watching the computer, okay? When I'm as frightened as can be, I sing Well, if you sing too loudly, somebody's gonna hear you and then you're probably gonna have more reason to be frightened. You must be some kind of a bug. I will ask the advice of my friend. She says she is a human being, but I think she is lying. She is some kind of a bug. So, in these terrifying costumes, and even more terrifying dialogue, they try to attack Thumbelina, these bugs. She runs away. It's pretty easy for her to get away, so that's good for her. Uh, she's living on her own in the woods, and she does fine until winter hits. And then she almost freezes to death, but she doesn't, because after much hesitation, she knocks on the door of Mrs. Mole. I'm not sure what she's actually called in this. But it's a little mole who lives underground, and she's like, hey, can I live here? And the mole's like, sure, come on in. Nice people, moles. Saving you from those pesky snowstorms that happen directly over your head and only over your head. The moles might be the most terrifying part, though. Of course I'll fix you something. But first, what is a pretty little girl doing out in the forest? Ugh, every, everything about how they look is not right. If you are going to marry anyone, it should be a mole. And the mole lady wastes no time in being like, Yo kid, you married? <laughs> you better get on that. <laughs> which is kind of a running theme, people just trying to marry Thumbelina off even though she's a kid, which is super uncomfortable. So Thumbelina's living in the mole house, and then she comes back home one day, and there's a a, a dude mole, uh, an old man mole. My, my, what a beautiful child. You were right. She is exquisite. Who's very creepily and very obviously trying to marry her. Side note, Thumbelina is supposed to be the size of a thumb, hence the name. What mole is that big? <laughs> I think the proportions are a little bit off here. He and my husband were good friends. And they just keep establishing how much older he is than her. It's very weird. He takes her to his mole house, and on the way they see a dead bird. Oh, the poor creature. Very sad. You don't like the blue skies and the trees? I like the tree roots. <laughs> wow, he's such a great conversationalist. So he basically takes her back to his house and he's like, look at all this stuff I have. You want to marry me? <laughs> to be honest, sir, I respect the drip, but I don't, I, just, I don't think she should marry you. Yeah, so he tells her he wants to marry her and she's super confused. I can't, I can't think straight looking at how creepy the costume is. I'm so sorry. It's just creepy. Oh, and there's several points in this movie where I feel like, oh, did I accidentally mute my device? Because there's no sound anymore. And then it's like, nope, that's just the movie. Some places just don't have any sound. Here I am with everything, and I'm unhappy. And there you are, a beautiful child with everything to look forward to, and you're unhappy. Ah, uh, hmm, red flag, hmm, time out. Don't call her a child and then ask her to marry you. That's... oh, that's so weird. I shouldn't really complain, because Mrs. Mole has been so good to me. Oh, her name is Mrs. Mole. I was right. I know I'm not handsome or young, but you must think of your future. So he's like, I know that I'm old enough to be your grandfather and, you know, am a mole, but you know, you really think you can do better? <laughs> and Mrs. Mole doesn't back her up either. She's just like, yo, he has money. You might as well marry him. What I am saying is for your future, for your own good. Poor kid. She's already only two inches tall. Give her a break. <laughs> she has another song about how she doesn't want to marry a mole in love underground because she's a flower child, which has a very distinctly 70s ring to my ear. I have to feel the sun again because I am... And then in the middle of this, she's randomly like, oh yeah, that dead bird I saw days ago? I should cover him up. That's 
That's kind of weird that there's a dead body just in the hallway. So she goes to cover him up and then she realizes, wait, this bird has a heartbeat. So she thaws him out and he's, he's fine. The blanket and Thumbelina's body warmth actually thawed the bird's frozen blood. Good for the bird. Smile, for tomorrow will be your wedding day. Her wedding's in the next day and you're just now fitting the dress? That's kind of poor planning, don't you think? Look, dear, it has really gone too far now. And so Mrs. Mole, after pressuring her into this marriage, is like, you can't back out now. It would be rude not to go through with a marriage now. Very good advice Mrs. Mole always gives. I feel so bad for all the actors that were stuck in those suits for God knows how long. That had to have sucked, man. So she goes back to see the bird, and he's gone, and she's sad about it. Wet radio, when December comes, never dies at all. So she sings, because anytime she feels any emotion at all, she sings. So she goes outside to see the trees, because in a very depressing thought, she's like, this is the last time I'll see the outside, since I'm gonna marry a mole. But her bird friend is okay. Oof, he also looks a little bit strange, don't you think? She climbs on his back and they fly away to somewhere where she can not be forced into an arranged marriage with a mole. And I love this because it's clearly meant to be outside, but you can see the shadow of the wings flapping on the wall behind them. And also this movie does this several times where like the narrator narrating the story is talking over the dialogue. It's also very strange. We realized how much we had been asking of the little oh, girl. The world is so she beautiful. needed people of her own Thank kind. You, and then again, because they haven't padded it out all enough already, um, there's a there's a montage of everything we've seen up to this point. She finds her way to all these other flower children in this big community, and the prince is like, "Oh yeah, you and I are supposed to get married. Everybody's trying to marry this poor girl." You're finally here. Our history books have said that someday the rightful queen of the flower children would come. So, so your history books told you about something that was going to happen in the future. Got it. <laughs> but I don't know you. And then she's like, hey, I need to get to know you and get to know this place before we get married to see if I like it. And you. Which is a smart move. You go Thumbelina. But then literally two seconds later she's like, I know I like it here. And we're going to get married. I know I will like it here. This is where I belong. And then she has a big song that she sings in the middle of her wedding. Happy ever after, you and me. Happy ever after. And then she lives happily ever after. Oh yeah, and then the girl who's learning about the story, the, the story within the story, that girl, uh, she goes and rides some more rides and then meets a cute boy. And I guess she's happy ever after. And then we get an end credit scene, even though this isn't the end of the movie, because they just lifted a, a different project and just inserted it into this one. Okay, now here's where it's tricky, because I could end the movie and this video right here, but I really now want to see that Jack and the Beanstalk version, so I'm gonna try to fit that in before I run out of battery. Okay, we're gonna see what happens. It will probably be a disaster. So you guys know the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, right? Jack is supposed to sell the family cow, and he trades it for magic beans, because Jack is a dumbass. We used to have a magic harp that sang to us each day. Then someone stole that magic harp. Okay, so he's singing a song about his magic harp being stolen and how he doesn't care. He's just like, eh, what are you gonna do? What's the use of being sad? It won't help you or me. We used to have a wondrous hen. And his magic hen got stolen? Tough times. We should have locked the door. We used to have a coach and four. I think this family's getting ripped off left and right. They need some help. <laughs> oh dear. And then we sold that coach and four to buy a loaf of bread. Doesn't feel like a fair trade. And the rest of their stuff got stolen. Ladies, ladies, step right up. So I guess this is the, uh, the shady bean salesman that he's gonna sell his cow to. Th they've really made some interesting choices with the wardrobe here because, like, this guy, it looks like they're kind of trying to go for, like, a, 
I, I don't know, like some kind of mix of old world clothing in there, but then this guy's just in like plaid 70s pants, so uh, I don't know, it's a whole lot. It's a look. <laughs> How was I to know that that cow of yours would stop giving milk after the 5,000 mile guarantee ran out? I... <sighs> okay. <laughs> so cows and cars are basically the same thing in this universe. Parker over there, will you? I don't think you park a cow. Is this guy gone to the future and just gotten used to cars and then came back and was like, ah, oh, shit, all I got are cows now. So now the shady salesman sings a song that does not inspire confidence of him, in me at least. Honest John, yes, that's my name. Magic Bean, yes, that's my game. And then he turns right around and tries to upsell the cow. What am I bid for her? Well, I'll pay $15. I'll pay 20 Poor cow. And then he just takes his sign and he's gone. So yeah, he takes the beans, he goes home, he's like, hey family, look, I have magic beans. And they're like, you dumbass. But then you take them right back. His sign is gone. Okay guys, I know it's supposed to be the middle of the night, but we could have had a little bit more lighting, don't you think? And right as I said that, my light went out. God damn it. <laughs> the universe got me for being snarky about the lighting setup in this movie. Come on, universe, that's my job. And the mom, who's wearing very modern glasses, by the way, maybe they're just like, maybe they're just in an alternate reality where the past and present are fused. I don't know. It's like in Aladdin when the genie had all those references to the future, even though it was very much not the future. <laughs> she throws him out the window, the beans that is, not her son, and uh, all of a sudden a beanstalk starts swinging from the Roof? No, growing from the ground. I'm sorry. I need to see where it goes. So up Jack goes, climbing the beanstalk. Do be careful. I don't think we should have let him go. Let him go. The beans are magic. So the mom's super worried, and the sister, in true sister fashion, is like, Psh, he'll be fine. Kids are resilient. <laughs> That's what I said to my mom every time my little brother climbed a magic beanstalk. What do I have for lunch? Oh, and here are the giants. The wife seems lovely. <laughs> Husband's a little rough around the edges. This is probably my favorite song so far in both versions, which is a little bit concerning to me because it's about this giant wanting to eat a child. <laughs> also, I've never understood that. Why does he smell the blood of an Englishman specifically? Or how, I guess, because like, do English men smell like fish and chips specifically? And he can like tell like Americans smell like Philly cheesesteaks. And so we're kind of distinguishable that way. <laughs> These are the thoughts that keep me up at night. All right, bring me some ale and bread. Quite a charmer, this giant guy. <laughs> I guess he forgot about blood of an Englishman and all because he just kind of goes to sleep. If I find him, I'll crush his bones. Oh, but he's up now. He's He's back at it. Look what I have, a magic Oh, so did he like steal everything from Jack in this version and Jack's just stealing everything back? I guess that makes Jack a little bit more sympathetic, I guess. Does that mean that a, a giant was just like tiptoeing down out of the sky with no beanstalk to just like snipe <laughs> stuff out of this people's tiny house? Come on, little hen, just like you did for the giant. Oh, so the hen isn't alive. I guess. How does it lay eggs? I'm very confused for several reasons at this point. And now Jack's success has made him famous enough that the shady salesman is like trying to ride the coattails of that success and sell more beans, even though he doesn't have any more beans. <laughs> and I'm only charging $10 a piece. $10? But how could they be magic for only $10? And then he loses customers because he's not trying to swindle them for enough money? I've made a mistake. It seems I've underestimated the power of the publicity I've gained. That gift could be used in so many scenarios. I love that. We need to let that surface. People need to know about that. Excuse me, sir. Are you the gentleman that gave our neighbor Jack his magic beans? Of course. Is this some complaint? I hear he returned with riches beyond his dreams. I mean, he just returned with the stuff that he had stolen from him. It's not... It's not that spectacular in this version. Like, sure, it makes more sense, like, morally why why Jack gets away with it, because it's his stuff, but, like, it's not as 
flashy. It's like if you robbed a, a car dealership and all you got out of it was the used Prius that they had bought off of you for way less than what it was worth a week before. Like, it would, it would be more morally excusable, but it wouldn't be, like, a, a super, like, flashy score, you know what I mean? A hundred dollars? Well, that's very steep. Ah, uh, yes, and so is the beanstalk that will magically grow. Sorry, moving on. Ah, oh, but the price is much more, madam. I would ask many thousands, but I am a friend of the people. So when you clicked on this video about Santa and the ice cream bunny, did you think you'd be at this point where you're now hearing the story within a story within a story of, like, the used car salesman that sold Jack the beans now has his own, like, ongoing plot where he's trying to swindle other people? Because I didn't. Oh, so now Jack's gonna go back up there and try to get his harp back. I was wondering when that would come back into play. Uh, we're back with the giants and their toxic gender roles, I guess. <laughs> I can play a little nursery song. Oh, and the harp gets a song. Great. So now the, the giant smells Jack again. Uh, maybe Jack should get some deodorant. I don't know what the situation is with that, but anyway. He knows he's back and he's even more pissed off because he's stolen something from him that he stole from him, but whatever. Oh, and right at this critical moment we go back to the salesman. Cool. If I could get my hands on him, I'd tear him limb from limb. No, that's too good for him. Oh, it looks like he's pissing some people off now. Look what you've done to the table! Oh god, that's very violent. Mother's got out. Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> so this time Jack gets away with the harp, but the giant starts climbing the beanstalk down after him. I don't know why he didn't do that the first time. And Jack's kind of just like, oh, I'll chop it down. <laughs> Weird, it's almost like that thing was hanging from the from the ceiling or something. <laughs> Anyway, that's done. <laughs> and now that Jack has murdered somebody in cold blood, he's like, I feel a little bit bad. Now I'm gonna sing a song about how, how rich I am. The giant is dead, and Jack is rich. We're happy as can be. And the whole town comes over to sing too. And even the shady salesman gets to join in, so I guess the moral of the story is lie to people and it'll all work out okay in the end. <laughs> okay, if you're still with me, Congratulations, you are the real MVP of the week. Now that we have gotten through both of those things, let's end this movie and this video forever. <laughs> Santa gets done telling his story either way, and the kids start bringing in more animals that are supposed to help, but they don't. And Santa finally decides, hey, I should probably take this heavy jacket off since it's direct heat and it's like right in the sun and I don't want to get heat stroke. Uh, and does anybody remember, it's like a whole year ago now, we started this movie and it was called Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, right? You may have noticed there is a surprising and disappointing lack of ice cream bunny. Well, fear not, because here he comes. <laughs> On a fire truck? <laughs> he just comes riding in with all these kids, past amusement park rides that I didn't realize they were anywhere near, and just rolls up on Santa like, I can handle this. And oh boy, he is strange looking. He never has ice cream, so I'm not sure why he's called the ice cream bunny. Did they want to call him the Easter Bunny, but they thought it was copyrighted? I don't understand that. Can't let anybody see Santa Claus without his coat on. Oh yeah, God forbid anybody sees you without your jacket on, Santa. The Ice Cream Bunny, of course. Of course. I know the Ice Cream Bunny. You, you surely know the Ice Cream Bunny, right? Looks like the Ice Cream Bunny's losing his head a little bit. Oh no. Oh, he's got kind of a, a weak eye there. I can't I'm not gonna make fun of him for it, because, you know, that's not cool. But also, I've kind of got that going on, so it's fine. Happens to the best of us, Mr. Ice Cream Bunny. There's so much to do and so little time to do it in. But of course, old friend, you will come through. That shot looks like the kids were waiting for a cue, and then they were given a cue, but they used, like, the whole of the clip. So the Ice Cream Bunny hooks up Santa's sleigh to his 
fire truck and pulls him out of the sand. Oh, I'm sorry, he pulls him to a different part of the sand. And But now he's gone, and so is the ice cream bunny. Now the whole sleigh's gone. Why? Why couldn't we have done that, like, two hours ago? Why was any of this necessary? It's the end of the movie, by the way. I am exhausted. <laughs> truly, I am truly exhausted right now. This is such a weird movie. Movies. Two versions of the same movie. It's just, it's strange all around. I see why you guys wanted me to talk about it, because it's just, like, unbelievably weird. But, uh, yeah. That's all I got for you guys today. I'm sure this is gonna be a longer video, uh, so if you're still watching, good for you for sticking it out. Just type like, JOIN THE ELF UNION all in caps, just so that I know you watched this far. But regardless, thank you for being here, thank you for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing, everything you do to support this channel. It doesn't matter if you watched one minute or the whole thing, it means the world to me that you're here in any capacity. This channel is just starting to get such a warm community building around it and I'm really really grateful so thank you. If you're new here and you're a fan of nonsense maybe consider sticking around because I post nonsense all the time. Ring the bell because my upload schedule is as chaotic as I am. I've got a ton of new content set to come out in the next couple of weeks. I've got a ton of Christmas content. I really, really want to get to as many of your guys' requests as I possibly can. So be ready to be hit with like extra content in the next couple of weeks. Remember, my name is Avery. I'm a YouTuber if you say so, because thanks to you guys, this is technically a YouTube channel. Bye!